Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Jennifer Coffey. I'm the executive director of AJAP. We're just going to wait another minute. We've got lots of participants streaming in now. We're up to about 55 so far, so we're going to give the technology another minute to load. Hey, Liz, what do you think? Should we get going? Yeah, whatever you think. I mean, there yeah, people can hop in if they're a little late, we, they'll still get everything. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, I think we've, we may have the award for the, the furthest zoom in because I sent this to my mom <laughs> in from Melbourne, Australia. So hi, mom. <laughs> mom never gets to attend Environmental Congress. So it's, it's here with us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen or do my very best to do so. I'll do that. And that. Okay, do you all have that? Yep. Yep. Wonderful. And look, I didn't even need my first slide. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody to the 37th Annual Environmental Congress and the very first ever virtual Environmental Congress. Uh, it's our great pleasure to be able to gather with you all. Um, we do miss uh, being together in the big room and, and having a nomination to open Congress, uh, mm -hmm. but we're all safe and secure and still doing the good work to protect and restore New Jersey's environment. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Jennifer Coffey. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the executive director of ANJAC. This year's Environmental Congress uh, will be held all month long. So rather than having one day where several hundred of us get together, we are gathering virtually throughout the month of October on Thursday evenings and Friday afternoons. Okay. And so if you happen to be on social media, we will be posting uh, on Facebook, but also live tweeting throughout the month, some of the great information that our speakers will be sharing. And we'll, we will be tweeting from at Anjack Tweets, which is our handle, and the hashtag will be Enviro Congress. So we invite you to use those as well and help us share some of the good information you'll be hearing all month long. A little bit of housekeeping. This is where I usually direct people to where the men's room, the women's room is, where you can get your bagels. But since I'm sure you all have snacks and know where your bathrooms are by now, uh, let's go through a little bit of a virtual housekeeping. We're going to ask that if you have a question, uh, you type it in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to hold this um, all month long as a kind of our protocol, the staff, ANJAC staff, many of whom you can see or will be able to see when we come off of, of screen share, uh, will monitor the questions and will answer them right there in the chat for you. And if they are a question for one of our speakers, they'll hold that to the end when we're taking Q&A. So know that we are actively monitoring that chat. If you are having technical difficulty that you just can't figure out in the chat function, cannot help you and we're not able to get you your video or you can't see the presentation or something wonky, um, then go ahead and call. Liz Ritter is a brave soul. She's given us her cell phone number. So she's our <laughs> deputy director. And you can go ahead and call her and she'll help you figure out um, you know, what, what's happening and if we can resolve some of your technical difficulties. Um, not general support, let's keep it to Environmental Congress and this Zoom, so but not general tech support, but she can help you solve just about anything else um, regarding to Congress that's happening. 
I do want everybody to know also that all sessions are being recorded and we will post them on Anjak's YouTube channel at a later date. All of the attendees who are signed up to attend Environmental Congress this month will be sent the link when those videos are made available. Okay, moving on. I wanna thank our stalwart sponsors and supporters for making Environmental Congress possible. There is a lot of staff time uh, that has gone into putting together Environmental Congress. Uh, I was just remarking to the staff before we started, we've all become uh, proficient, if not comfortable, at presenting virtually, which is very different than where we were in February of this year. And we've also become uh, proficient in holding live performances. So we, I think we can all add producer to our, our title now as well. And so we, we have a great number of long-term um, stalwart sponsors who make this programming possible. And we just want to thank them from the bottom of our heart. Uh, we also want to thank many of our co-sponsors, which you'll see down below. These are nonprofit organizations who will, will be presenting all month long, who present regularly with ANJAC and ANJAC presents with them. And we do that because we know that partnerships are important and we know that we could not accomplish what we need to accomplish in New Jersey with the big threats we have from climate change, flooding, water supply, open space needs, um, electric vehicles, clean energy supply without working together. So we wanna thank the many, many nonprofits in New Jersey and that list continues to grow, um, if not that by the hour, by the day. And so we'll update it throughout the month as well. Um, and of course, many of our foundations uh, as well that provide long-term sustainable funding for ANJAC to be able to continue the kind of programming that we bring to you. And now I'm having technical difficulty where my slides won't advance. There we go. And I wanna thank all of you, environmental commissioners, uh, elected officials, members of the legislature and their staff who are here with us today. This is ANJAC at home. This is where we're working from uh, on a regular basis. And so we wanna thank you for doing everything that you do to protect and restore our environment. I also wanna thank our board members, many of whom are, are here with us this evening for their continued support, action, dedication. Uh, without ANJAC's board, none of this would be possible. So I wanna thank them. And so I want us to get onto the main programming tonight, but without, I need to acknowledge something amazing that happened and there's really just one word for it and that word is plastics. <laughs> so for those of you who have not seen The Graduate, you now have homework. You have to see The Graduate. Go see The Graduate. <laughs> plastics is, is a long-term fight for many of us. We have all heard any of us who have attended Congress in recent years have heard me say that the World Economic Forum report has been particularly impactful for me and I know it has for many of you. And that report says that by 2050, so by 2050, not that long from now, when my dear niece Giselle, who's in Melbourne, Australia, will be my age, unless we do something different, about the way we use single-use plastics. We will have more plastic than fish in our oceans by the time my dear niece Giselle is my age. And I know that none of you want to leave a plastic ocean and rivers to your nieces, your nephews, your children, your grandchildren. And so you rose up and you did something about it. And you did a big thing. Through local action and 100 and 30 municipal ordinances, you helped divert and stop the pollution of 400 million, 400 million single use plastic bags simply by local ordinances. So I know we can't hear each other, but I know the staff are clapping. I know all of you are clapping. You have done a phenomenal, phenomenal job by heeding the call to action and saying, look, enough is enough and we are not going to leave a plastic ocean and plastic rivers to our nieces, our nephews, our children, our grandchildren. And in 2018, we had two ordinances and you rose up and took action 
because there was an industry backed bill that governor governor murphy thankfully vetoed it was a bad bill it would have looked like new jersey was doing something when we actually weren't we worked and jack worked for the last two years with key sponsors in the legislature senator smith assemblywoman pinkin assemblyman mckeon and many 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 others and brought to them the evidence that local support was there. It was there to take statewide action. And sorry, my cell phone is going off <laughs> the perils of virtual presenting. <laughs> you took action locally, legislators started to pay attention. And Jack worked with a national coalition called Plastic Free Water. So shout out to our birthday girl, Nandini Chekos here with us tonight who represented ANJAC on that coalition, we learned from what California did, what Washington DC did, what Vermont, what Maryland with Massachusetts did in terms of plastic pollution. And we took the very best of what they did. And we learned from where the chemistry council and the plastics industry attacked their ordinances. And we, we wrote a better ordinance. We built a better mousetrap. And last week, last week, last Thursday, New Jersey Senate, New Jersey's assembly, passed with bipartisan support, the strongest bill in the nation to end plastic pollution coming out of New Jersey. I had a meeting just a few hours ago with, and yes, you just big claps on that. That's where I would ask everybody to stand up at Congress and big claps for that. I had a meeting several hours ago with the senior policy advisors to Governor Murphy. And while much of that meeting is confidential, I can tell you two things. One, I can tell you that they pointed to a quote from Governor Murphy's spokesman, Mahan, and I had help with the pronunciation, so I apologize in advance, Mahan Gunter, oh, help me, Sheila. <laughs> Gunter Tarana. Uh, my apologies for mispronouncing that. The governor's spokesman said to the New York Times over the weekend, quote, the governor is proud to support the strongest bag ban in the nation. This bill will significantly reduce the harm that the products cause to our environment. So that is a very, very strong signal from the governor's office that he is interested in signing this bill into law. But what I also heard today from the governor's office policy folks was disturbing. They're getting a lot of pressure from industry and specifically the polystyrene industry to veto or conditionally veto the bill. And so you have done so much work. You have passed 130 ordinances. You have made phone calls and sent emails when we asked you to. We have certainly stayed up late nights and I have worn nearly a hole in the carpets in my apartment pacing back and forth on the phone to senators and assemblymen trying to beat back the industry lies. We have seen ad buys on local TV from industry advocates asking for changes to this bill. This bill needs to be signed. Governor Murphy needs to sign it and we need you. We will post in the chat. We need you to call Governor Murphy Sorry, I don't have this in a slide. 609-292-6000. 609-292-6000. We'll get that posted in the chat. We need you to call him and ask him to support and sign the plastics bill into law. And then we will have some kind of big old virtual party to celebrate the strongest bill in the nation. So with that, and without further ado, um, you are going to hear later, excuse me, my phone is ringing. <laughs> uh, you will... You will hear shortly from Governor Murphy, and I want to encourage and, and steal a little bit of his thunder. I want to encourage you to continue your action and your advocacy through voting this now through November 3rd. We're pleased to partner with the League of Women Voters this year to provide voter education. You will start to see graphics like this appear on ANJAC social media channels. We will also send you emails. This year in New Jersey, you can register to vote online. Voter registration deadline is October 13th. You go to nj.gov backslash state backslash elections or simply Google register to vote in New Jersey. And you can register to vote from your phone, from your home, from wherever you are so that you too can participate in this election. 
In New Jersey, all registered voters will be receiving a ballot. So you should receive your ballot at home anytime from now up until the election. Most counties are sending out or have sent out their ballots already. So continue to register to vote online and you will receive your ballot. If you are not comfortable with mailing in your ballot or putting your ballot into a Dropbox location, then you can go ahead and vote at a polling location provisionally. So a provisional ballot simply means that the election officials will double check to make sure you haven't also mailed in a ballot. If you have any questions about this, go ahead and post in the chat and we can get back to you either tonight or at another time. One more thing to know, in New Jersey, we typically receive sample ballots so we can look at them before we go to the polls. Since we're all receiving actual ballots this year, you are not receiving a sample ballot. So do not send that directly to the recycling bin. It is your actual ballot. I got mine today. Um, I haven't opened it yet, but I do have it. So I'm pretty excited to, to vote by, by mail this year. So with that said, one more note before we move on to our larger programming. ANJAC is supported, not like some public radio stations say, by donors like you. We are supported by you. So the people who are here with us today. And I know it is very difficult times, but I do want to ask that if you can, if you would please consider making a small donation to ANJAC. ANJAC is approximately 70% funded by foundation grants, and we love our foundations and we appreciate their support. But most of that money, something like 95% of that foundation money, cannot be used for lobbying expenses. Last year, ANJAC spent about $4,000 on lobbying, and we pretty much doubled, if not tripled that this year. There was a lot of work to do. And so we do that with donations from people like you. So if we had 30 new donors this month at $15 a month, that would equal one month of lobbying. I wanted to say in Trenton, but we're doing it all pretty much virtually and by phone these days. If we had five new donors at $30 a month, that would fund our Big mouthful, Fundamentals for Effective Environmental Commissioners. So our spring training boot camp that we provide for, for many of you who are here with us tonight to tell you how ECs um, ideally should operate, some of the challenges that you face, your requirements under the law, how to review a site plan application, how to, how to look at a stormwater plan and make heads or tails of it. And all of your donations help us to continue to support you, your municipality, and to take your story to the DEP and to Trenton and to explain how state rules and laws are or are not working and how they need to be fixed. So we appreciate your activism, your action, your donations, and for you being here tonight. With that, I just wanna thank you and remind you of our website and where we're tweeting from. And if you have any questions, go ahead and email info at anjack.org. And I realize it's not on this slide, but hashtag EnviroCongress is our hashtag for the evening. And you can go ahead and, and share on Twitter and be part of the, the Twitterverse with us. So with that, now we are going to welcome uh, remarks from our governor. And we have a short video from him. Liz, I think you're going to cue that up. Uh, yes, I oh, am. I see Liz. There we go. <laughs> hey everybody, Governor Phil Murphy here. I want to thank Executive Director Jennifer Coffey for the invitation to be a part of the 47th Annual New Jersey Environmental Congress. Plain and simple, climate change is the greatest threat facing humanity today. And although we are still in the throes of a pandemic and battling our way through an economic crisis, we must not lose sight of the urgency of this issue. In our beautiful state, the effects of climate change are already felt. In fact, New Jersey is warming at a rate faster than almost all other states, and we need to make changes now to protect our state's future. In June, thanks in great part to the advocacy of First Lady Tammy Murphy, we became the first state in the nation to incorporate climate change education across all K through 12 education standards. Now every student will be prepared to explore, imagine and advocate 
for the innovative solutions to this crisis needed in the communities in which they live. I am incredibly proud of this generation of students. And with the inclusion of these standards, I know they will become the leaders who will take New Jersey to 100% clean energy by the year 2050, as called for in our energy master plan that my administration released in January. In the meantime, we are doing all we can to make sure that countless high quality green economy jobs will be waiting for them as they graduate. In fact, we soon will be taking the next steps in creating the very first purpose-built offshore wind port in the USA. The New Jersey wind port will be home to multiple factories building the necessary parts for offshore wind turbines. It will also be able to take advantage of our world-leading geographic location, allowing the parts manufactured here to be moved directly from the port to the offshore wind farms that are going to rise off our coastline. By supporting our goal to build 7,500 megawatts of offshore wind energy by the year 2035 and generating enough clean energy to power half of New Jersey's homes, this is a critical investment in New Jersey's future. And on New Jersey's future, I'm equally optimistic. Just a few weeks ago, I signed an environmental justice law that will bring a sea change in how government views its responsibilities to ensure the rights of its people to clean air and clean water. Residents in our environmental justice communities, who are predominantly people of color, have suffered from adverse health conditions at rates many times that of residents elsewhere. No longer will economically disadvantaged areas of our state be dumping grounds, and no longer will the rights of residents to clean air and clean water be overlooked. This law is a historic step on its own to ensure true community input and collaboration. But unless we have responsible leadership at all levels of government, its promise cannot be fulfilled. So as I express my gratitude for all of you participating in this year's Environmental Congress, I would also urge you to continue your advocacy through voting in the upcoming election. As I said, I am incredibly optimistic for the future of New Jersey, but we must act together to see these changes fully come to fruition. Thank you and God bless each and every one of you. Hey. Thank you, Governor Murphy. Um, okay, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Beth Ashman Ainsley and Michelle Byers. Um, about five or six years ago, Ann Jack um, and Candy Ashman and the group of us decided that uh, Candy needed to be honored in a lasting way. And Candy, of course, being Candy, wanted some say in how exactly we were gonna do that. I know nobody's surprised about that, but it was great. We, she and I sat down and hashed out guidelines for who these people could be and what um, would be required to be for Candy to pick you from uh, a list or a thought. And indeed, um, this year, even though she can't be with us, we're so glad to have her daughter here with us. And I know that Candy would be so thrilled to see that the first uh, award after she passed went to her longtime mentor and colleague, Michelle Byers. So Beth. Thank you. Well, Michelle, it's really an honor and such a privilege and a pleasure for me to present this award to you. It's titled the Candace McKee Ashman Environmental Legacy um, Award. Uh, I wish, of course, that mom was right here to give it to you, uh, but I want you to know that I feel confident she's sitting on your shoulder every single day and guiding you and uh, supporting you in all of your accomplishments, and she would be so proud to know that you are being recognized. Um, I, I know how extremely... Um, how extremely hard you work. I've witnessed it. I've been around when you can't get together with me when I'm there because you're working. Um, so I, I want to let you know that I appreciate that tireless work. Um, I know that you have an admirable uh, dedication to the environment and your expertise is, is impeccable. Um, you have worked so hard to 
advocate for strong and um, responsible state and regional environmental protection. Uh, it's hard to drive around Somerset County anyway without seeing areas that you are specifically protecting. And over the years, you've told me about so many of those green spaces and natural habitats and farmlands and things that you, your organization has designated to protect and preserve forever. And uh, I think we all should be so grateful to you for that. Um, you, you have empowered the people around you to be effective and very productive in their uh, work with government officials at all levels, at the, at the you know, local level and at the, at the government level. Um, you're a leader, you're, you're a true leader. And um, I recognize those qualities in you uh, as mom did long ago. Um, you're a leader in the campaign to improve environmental policy in New Jersey. You're a leader in preserving and protecting all those green spaces for all of our children to come and generations to come. You're a leader in protecting and trying to help us have clean drinking water and our water supplies. Um, and you've created those lovely green spaces, which we all appreciate. Um, you're a true steward of the earth and and I love you for that. And mom is really proud of you. So congratulations. Well deserved. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. I'm just going to share a little, um, before Michelle speaks, I'm going to share a little uh, token of our appreciation that we've created for you that we will get to you in the next, uh, I don't know when we'll get it to you, but we will get it to you, Michelle. So thank you and well deserved. You're muted. Um, thank you all so much. I'm like so extremely humbled and honored and um, just, you know, so in touch with how much Candy uh, meant to me and what she um, provided and contributed to me during my life. I mean, I met her in 1981 um, and she's been a part of my life all of these years. And she saw things in me that I didn't see. Uh, and she supported me and cheered me on and pushed me relentlessly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, you know, it was, was a, it just an incredible force in my life. Um, and it was, it, it, I have to say, it's just been incredibly rewarding to have my, my life basically growing up under her mentorship. Um, she and Dave Moore and so many others in that generation, Helen Fenske and uh, who all came out of that time of the jet port at the Great Swamp and really are responsible for mentoring tons of people like me and like all of you, uh, but also making sure that we had a law to, for environmental commissions to operate. And, and then, you know, that we had the Pinelands Protection Act and the Highlands Act and the Farmland Preservation Program and the State Planning Act and on and on and on, Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, these are all Candy's legacies, and I've just been long, you know, um, in awe of her and in awe of everyone that I've worked with and been very fortunate to have a role that I feel brought a huge amount of meaning to my life and made my life worthwhile to live, and I feel like I am very proud of that. And, I, you know, I miss her terribly. Um, you know, it's just like uh, when the, these generations move on, it's everything shifts under your feet and I feel that shifting now um, and uh, you know it's my hope that the, that there are other thousands of young people that we are all you know getting up underneath their wings and encouraging them to take up these issues and to to really be committed to preserving the environment there's nothing more important really than water and air and land and wildlife and you know, the, the basic quality of life that we all really yearn for and all went to um, immediately when the pandemic hit. Uh, I think it really underscored just how important this mission is. And it's not just an environmental mission, it's a human mission. Uh, and Candy really uh, instilled in me so many things. And she always told me that I was brave. And I always thought, geez, I don't know where she got that from. I don't feel brave at all. Um, but it made me feel like, well, you know, maybe I have to try a little harder or step out a little more, or 
courageously because Candy thinks I'm brave. <laughs> <laughs> so we all need to be brave um, and keep, keep on keeping on. And I just can't thank you enough. It's just such an incredible honor. Um, and uh, so great to see your face, faces. And Beth, um, thank you. Your words uh, mean a whole lot to me. I love you all. Thank you. Michelle, it's our great pleasure to uh, recognize your service with the uh, Ken McKee Ashman Environmental Legacy Award. And I feel honored to be bound together in, uh, with you in Candy's legacy. There are so very many of us from so many, many generations that she both personally reached out to and tapped on the shoulder and said, hey, you. And um, that's pretty much what she said, hey, you. <laughs> pulled you into her universe and um you know in a secondary and tertiary way there are thousands upon thousands of us and it is a phenomenal legacy um, to be part of i also want to thank in your 60th anniversary so new jersey conservation foundation is celebrating their 60th anniversary this year uh and we want to thank our partners there and i know we have many of our colleagues at, at that organization here with us tonight and so um, I want to thank them for, for doing your good work on the, the land preservation side. And, you know, you hold your, con your, your conference in the spring um, that provides so much uh, information and so many resources for EC counterparts in the open space committees. And so it's, it's just a wonderful partnership um, between ANJAC and NJCF. And it's, it's our honor to have you here to share that with you. And Beth, I, thank just, you. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And as I said before, sharing your mom with us. Um, we just, you know, we, we loved her very, very much. Thank you both, that's awesome. Okay. So now with um, tears in our eyes, <laughs> yeah. want to celebrate a little bit more uh, at Environmental Congress. And we wanna recognize um, oh so many environmental commissioners and the, um, uh, the phenomenally hard work that you have done to protect and restore local environment in the community. We know, live and breathe that local environment matters and you really make it happen. So we have some exceptional awards, um, environmental excellence awards to share with exceptional commissions tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to Sheila and Liz. Hi everybody. Um, I am thrilled to be introducing the uh, Environmental Achievement Award winners for 2020. I'm sorry that we can't see you and take your picture like we often do at the Congress, but um, Sheila has created a wonderful presentation. We really want to thank all of you that took the time to fill in applications, to sit, to submit applications, and the award winners really have gone above and beyond, and a lot of them have a lot of stories to share about how even during this 2020 season, they've still been managing to persevere and even succeed and even uh, move forward in ways they never dreamed that they could do in, back in February. So thank you to everyone. Um, and we're going to start out with uh, the Berkeley Heights Environmental Commission. They did a project called 1000 Trees. With us tonight, receiving the award sort of, is Kim Diamond, Richard Leister, and Angus Chen. In January, the Berkeley Heights Township Council member Susan Pogue applied for a thousand tree seedlings from NJDEP and the Berkeley Heights EC planned on distributing them on Arbor Day in April. COVID happened and NJDEP suspended delivery of the tree seedlings. At the beginning of May, the EC came up with a new plan for distribution which required residents to pick up their seedlings. With less than a month to develop a plan, the BCEC set up a pro promotional campaign they picked up over 1,000 seedlings and set up a contact-free distribution procedure and more than 160 residents stopped by to pick up seedlings. An additional 400 seedlings were went to the fourth grades in the town. Thank you, Berkeley Heights. The next Environmental Achievement Award goes to the Caldwell Environmental Commission. Um, with us this evening is Ann Marchione, who's the Environmental Commission Chair. The Caldwell Environmental Commission has been promoting pollinator gardens for a number of years. They were planning on offering a workshop accompanied by native plant distribution for Earth Day this year, but guess what? The pandemic came and those plans were canceled. 
Instead, they convinced Dr. Doug Tallamy, author of Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, to offer a webinar for his new book. His fee was high, so the EC got other groups to sponsor. West Caldwell EC, the Kiwanis of West Essex, Morgan Farm of the Cedar Grove Historical Society, among others. The promotion for this event resulted in a registration of 1,365 people for the Zoom presentation. I, I can't even believe that they did that. And we really want to, can't believe it. And we are so proud of that presentation that you managed to do in the spring. Thank you, the Caldwell Environmental Commission. Next, we have the Cherry Hill Environmental Board. Lou Gorman, the Environmental Commission Chair, is um, on hand to re hear about that, to receive that award. The Cherry Hill, uh, their project was called the 10th anniversary of the Cherry Hill Trails Program. With only one abandoned trail in existence in 2009, the Cherry Hill Trail System has grown to 11 locations with multiple trails at most locations and has gained the U.S. Department of Interior's National Recreation trail recognition for two locations. The Cherry Hill Environmental Board took advantage of the 10th anniversary to market the availability of the trails, to educate people about natural life on open spaces, and provide opportunities for people to both interact and support natural areas and trails. Activities included developing at least an article a month highlighting a trail in the weekly mayor's message with pictures and information, community service opportunities for ch church groups, private corporations, and the public. There were also educational articles about common wildlife that live in open space areas. They developed a robust schedule of activities in order to increase usage of the trails, and they opened a new trail system, the Thomas Paine Trail System, in February, which was welcomed in the community as it was an off-road connection from a number of developments to and from an elementary school. They also created a Cherry Hill Trails Challenge inspired by National Park Service Junior Ranger Program. Congratulations to the Cherry Hill Environmental Board. Next up is the Keyport Environmental Commission with their project, Cedar Street Beach Dune Restoration Project. And here from Keyport tonight is Dennis Fotopoulos, council member, Victoria Pacheco, and Heather Brady. In Keyport, sand was being blown from the dunes into an adjacent park at great inconvenience and expense to the borough. In an effort to build resiliency from storm surges and preserve their shoreline, the Keyport Borough Environmental Commission employed a living shoreline policy that started with dune restoration. A group of volunteers began by clearing the area of invasive plants. They received help from Jersey Shore Surf Ride Association and consulted with a local ecologist and began plantings in late 2017. They repeated the effort, effort in late 2018 and by late 2019, the dooms were climbing and the beach grass was thriving. Yay, Keyport, great job. Uh, the next uh, commission is the Lambertville Environmental Commission for their project called Ditching Disposables. Uh, with us tonight is Elizabeth McGill Peer, the Environmental Commission Chair. Lambert Bill's 2018 ordinance banning the use of plastic straws, polystyrene, styrofoam, and plastic bags by businesses in the city of Lambertville spurred the Ditching Disposables Initiative, which focused on fueling a culture shift away from single use plastics. They do this by educating the community providing residents with a range of easy to adopt actions that can help transition away from single use plastics and reinforcing and, reinforcing and celebrating positive changes. The following suite of programs are the result. Sustainable Business Forum, Ditching Disposables Reusable Bag Education Campaign, and Community Canvassing Day. Repurpose a T-shirt workshop, Sustainability Lecture, Sustainability Story Time, Plastic Ordinance Info Session, and Distribution of Ditching Disposable Signage to Businesses, Sustainable Business Awards, and Green Business Certification. Congratulations, Lambertville. That's a lot of work you guys have done. And you certainly were spurring on the plastic movement when, some, when we were all just starting this. So kudos to you. Nice. Thank you, Julie and Cheryl. <laughs> 
Coming up next is the Madison Environmental Commission for their project, which was an eco house and garden tour. We have quite a crowd from Madison tonight. Uh, Claire Whitcomb is here. She's the Environmental Commission Chair. Marilyn Muzilski, Maureen Byrne from the Council, Joan McCarry from the Environmental Commission, Peter Freed from Sustainable Madison, Bridget Daly from the Environmental Commission, Eileen Cranefuss from the Environmental Commission, Janet Foster from the Madison Preservation Commission, Kathleen Cacavalli from Sustainable Madison, Lisa Jordan from Sustainable Madison, Jim Foster from the Zoning Board, Kristen Wallenstein from the Green Team, Chris Kellogg, an architect, and Helen Carr, also from the Zoning Board. Madison Environmental Commission organized an eco house and garden tour, which highlighted energy efficient houses with geothermal, geothermal heating and cooling, ultra insulated walls and windows, induction stoves, and airtight energy saving construction. For more conventional houses, the tour offered accessible ideas for saving energy solar systems and energy, energy retrofits. Gardens on the tour showcase, showcase both pollinator friendly native plants and organic vegetables, as well as beehives and chickens. In addition to the tour, the Madison Environmental Commission was offering a $49 discounted energy audits and selling composters and rain barrels. Not only did they show them what they should do, but they gave them the opportunity to get the tools to act on it. Congratulations, Madison, terrific. Um, up next is the Madison Township Environmental Commission for their work on completing their natural resource inventory. With us here tonight is Mary Reese, the Environmental Commission Chair, Frank Derby, also on the Environmental Commission, and Tara Kenyon, a consultant. In 2016, a new Environmental Commissioner from Montgomery attended Fundamentals for the Effective Environmental Commissions which is an ANJEC training, and went in search of the Natural Resource Inventory, or NRI. What he found was a document more than 10 years old using data that by that point was 20 years old. The Montgomery EC prepared their 2018 budget in, to include partial funding for the updating the NRI, and the remaining costs were covered by the planning board. In addition, the town's in-house GIS specialist provided mapping for the report which allowed for cost savings as well as enhanced accuracy due to township generated data sets and on the ground knowledge. This NRI not only, not only catalogs the natural resources in the municipality, it goes beyond that and identifies over 65 potential projects which will become a work plan for the Environmental Commission and the township overall. May all NRIs and ERIs be used as work plan documents. What a great example, Montgomery, thank you. Next, last Environmental Commission project is from Wall Township, and the, their project is a perspective on environmentally yours insightful articles. And with us today is the Environmental Commission Chair, Wilma Morrissey. The Wall Township Environmental Advisory Committee has at, published a series of environmentally yours articles, which are published in the monthly Wall Township Living Magazine. The list of published articles started in March of this year who we are and what we do, facts on single plastic bags, choose cloth bags, green business recognition program, planting your own garden, how and where to recycle, the community park self-guided nature tour, the rec pond nature preserve, conservation and green money savings tips, cover a variety of issues and actions that can be taken. The benefits of the series are twofold. The residents of the town can get some environmental education and the Environmental Advisory Committee can let them know who they are and what they offer in education resources for their community. Congratulations, Wall Township, that's wonderful. Our next award is a uh, nonprofit and community organization category and it's for Sustainable Princeton for their project, the Princeton Climate Action Plan or CAP. With us today from Sustainable Princeton is Kristen Symington. Sustainable Princeton worked with businesses, subject matter experts, community groups, schools, and Princeton University to work on addressing climate change while fostering community. In a 16 month effort, they, effort, they provided an ambitious community-based plan to reduce emissions by 50% from 2010 levels 65% by, by 2030, to reduce them by 65% by 2030 
by 2040 and by 80% by 2050, while still pursuing efforts to achieve 100% reductions. Object objectives were broken down into energy, land use, transportation, natural resources, materials management, and resiliency. They engaged over 4,600 community members, including 50 who served on a steering committee and five working groups. Over 80 meetings were held to vet and finalize the plan's 84 specific strategies, and a draft plan was made available for feedback. To ensure that the, the action plan's objectives are actually attained, Sustainable Princeton holds various educational events, such as Princeton's Ask an Expert, Expert series, Great Ideas series, Green Fest, and Farmer's Market to share knowledge and reinforce sustainable behaviors community-wide. The community the Climate Action Plan was adopted by Princeton Council in July of 2019. Specific strategies identified in the plan have been pursued, including adoption of a green building and environmentally, environmental sustainability element into the master plan, the implementation of a renewable energy aggregation plan, which offers Princeton residents access to a cleaner energy at a small cost savings, resiliency planning and establishment of a flood and stormwater commission and many more uh, uh, projects are underway in Princeton. Thank you, Princeton. What a great job. And our last award, it goes to the Warren Green Team and their project, Living in Harmony with Nature. The Warren Green Team responds to COVID-19. With us tonight from Warren is Laura Mandel. She's the EC and the Green Team Chair. Susan Deitels from the Environmental Commission. Shweta Agrawal from the Green Team. Eileen Dutree from the Green Team, and Gloria Meyer also from the Green Team. The Warren Green Team initiated a series of educational materials and virtual events entitled Living in Harmony with Nature in order, in order to promote sustainable practices in Warren Township during the COVID-19 shutdown. They use social media and the Township website to promote updated comprehensive resources while people sheltered in place. This resulted in an 1,800%, yes, 1,800% increase in re reader viewership. In partnership with the Somerset County Library System, they conducted a two-part webinar series on environmental topics for Warren residents, including discover how to incorporate healthy environment, environmental standards in your home and yard and why it matters, and managing your environmental footprint. Finally, Finally, they initiated a food drive and collected over 2,500 pounds of food, plus an additional anonymous donation worth $1,000. They have already have two more food drives scheduled for September and November. What a great work by the Warren Green team. Thank you so much. And that wraps up the awards. We really wanna thank all the 2020 awardees for all the work they've done and all the other environmental commissions and other groups that have really been working hard on a lot of projects all year, even through the extenuating circumstances that we have found ourselves in. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much for all of your work. You, you, you do tremendous, tremendous work for the environment, for your community to make New Jersey a better place to live. I wanna thank you all so much. But Liz, we actually have one more award that I didn't tell you about. Um, it's the Environmental Achievement Award to Elizabeth Ritter for 20 years, 20 years I say, of outstanding service to ANJAC and New Jersey's environment. And we celebrate that this month. Um, we left some tokens of appreciation on Liz's desk this morning, but uh, in addition to commemorate her 20 years of outstanding service to ANJAC and to all of you uh, environmental commissioners out there, we have arranged for a tree planting in her hometown of Randolph uh, at a community park. The planting will happen this spring and pandemic providing. Uh, she can invite her family and ANJAC staff can come and we can celebrate um, two decades of phenomenal, phenomenal service and dedication to New Jersey's environment. So Liz, thank you so much for everything that you do and have done. Thank you yeah. guys, thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I had a nice surprise when I got to the office this morning, flowers and champagne and everything and now a tree. 
Thank you so much. I really, you guys are great. You're a great team and all the people attending. I've probably spoken to you 20 times in the last few days and uh, I love working with you and being inspired by the work you do around the state and my, the team at ANJAC is phenomenal. There's nothing better than these guys. Thank you, everybody. Here, here. <sighs> and so as we're heading for the last few, um, <laughs> the last few uh, items in our agenda and trying to keep our programming for you uh, to an hour each session, as is our, our goal this month to, um, you know, to hit the 60, 60 to 90 minute mark. We've got a lot to say about things like climate change, so it might take us a little bit longer in future sessions. Uh, but we are pleased to share uh, some words from one of New Jersey's senators, uh, Senator Booker. And so Liz, um, wearing one of the multiple hats that she does, will now play IT director and queue up that video. Hi, it's Senator Cory Booker, and it is a privilege to give you my warmest regards as you all gather for your 47th Environmental Congress. Uh, Anjef has been at it for over 50 years, leading and championing and educating so, so many to make sure that we as a planet continue to thrive and survive, that we focus on the challenges of our ecology, the urgencies of climate change, and the demands of environmental justice. I'm proud that in the Senate, I've introduced bills to do, bills to do everything from protect our wetlands to take on the challenges of climate change. And as one of the founders of the Environmental Justice Caucus, I'm proud for my fights and my work with others for the urgency of environmental justice. But you all give me strength and hope that we won't just fight the good fight, but that we will be victorious. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your light working. Thank you for being such powerful agents of hope for a better tomorrow. We want to thank Senator Booker for his work um, on climate change, on environmental justice. He has a bill pending in Congress. Uh, to, uh, he has several bills pending in Congress, but the two that, that I think of um, most frequently, the first is in no particular order, uh, a billion trees planted. And so it's an initiative to try to increase carbon sequestration, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, fortify our coast and riverine areas from flooding. And it would be a phenomenal effort if Congress would pass and fund it. And so we have great hopes um, for that happening in the near future. Um, so see, get out to vote slide. Uh, and Governor, or Governor, <laughs> Senator Booker also has a bill um, that he has introduced in Congress that looks very much like the environmental justice bill that Governor Murphy just signed into law. And so that bill was made possible by the Newark Environmental Commission, by the Ironbound Community Corps, by the environmental justice, um, uh, sorry, the EJA, Environmental Justice Associates, and many, many, many citizens and advocates in, uh, in our cities, in our EJ communities, and throughout our great state of New Jersey who made that happen. And so there's been local action in Newark, there has been state action in New Jersey, and we hope to see federal action someday soon. So see slide that talks about voting. With that, I would like to um, share my screen. So hold on one moment as I take over as IT director here. And last but certainly not least before we close out this evening, we would like to acknowledge, whoo, come back. Where'd it go? There we are. We would like to acknowledge this year's Lechner Scholarship winner. Uh, this is our next generation of um, hope and talent and brilliance for the environment. This year's award goes to Kaylee De Pasquale and Jack awards this scholarship uh, biennially in memory of Hermia Lechner to honor her commitment to the preservation of open space and natural resources in New Jersey. Kaylee is a junior at Ryder University. She's majoring in earth sciences with a concentration in marine sciences, which is near and dear to my heart, Kaylee. Since May 2019, Kaylee has been working as an assistant naturalist for the Monmouth County Park System. 
She's been learning and teaching others about the Manasquan Reservoir at the Environmental Center there. Through this position, Kaylee has seen firsthand how conservation efforts lead to the preservation of freshwater and habitat protection. So Kaylee, we thank you for your service. We thank you for your studies. We are absolutely pleased to provide you with this small scholarship um, to help you continue your studies in environmental and marine sciences. And we look forward to working with you for many, many years to come. So congratulations, Kaylee. And as we close out this evening, I've, uh, I found that phone number for you. So for Governor Murphy, let's call him, at, you know, because I'm always asking for something. So I'm asking you one more time to do something this evening or, or first thing tomorrow. Go ahead and give yourself a calendar note. Um, call him every day if you like. Uh, call Governor Murphy at 609-292-6000 and ask him to sign the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act into law. We are very hopeful that he will, but we know, we know that industry advocates from the plastic industry, from the oil and gas industry, from the polystyrene industry, that's uh, styrofoam for food, are lobbying him very, very hard to make changes to the bill. We feel strongly that the bill is the strongest in the nation. It is built on your hard work and we want him to sign it into law. So go ahead and make that one phone call if you could, please. And with that, I wanna wish you all a very good evening and invite you to join us tomorrow at noon where we'll, we will be hearing from Sean LaTourette, who is the deputy commissioner at the DEP and also chief of staff to Commissioner Catherine McCabe. Uh, Sean will be walking us through some DEP priorities and what we can expect from them coming up next. There's lots of good stuff about climate change, electric vehicles, energy, um, the PACT rules protecting against climate change, environmental justice rules that will be coming. So please tune in tomorrow at noon. You should already have the link in your email. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you then and um, reading your tweets at hashtag EnviroCongress. So with that, um, I wish you all a good evening and I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, take care everybody.